Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen only mode for today's session. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Jen Shopcorn from the US Census Bureau. Jen, you may begin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is, as Anthony said, Jen Shopcorn, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's webinar, Data Toolbox, Administrative Data. This is the fifth of a series, and it's my privilege to wrap up the series with you. We really appreciate you spending time with us today so we can share a conversation about how, um, about what the future might look like in terms of administrative data use in the Census Bureau's diverse work. Like I mentioned, this is the fifth of five panels. So if you're joining us for the first time and you missed the first four, don't fret. We have posted, well, I guess we're about to post them online for you. Um, whether you did view them or you missed them, I wanted to give everyone a quick recap to put everyone in the same mindset for today's panel. If you have been with us on this journey, you heard to kick it off a great administrative data 101. Um, you also heard a robust discussion about how administrative data factor into the broad work that we do, everything from the decennial census and population estimates to some of our more innovative and impactful work using administrative data in the non-decennial, non-population estimates work. And then finally, earlier this week, we had a really great discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of administrative data. One thing I'm really interested in exploring today, I hope my panelists are there with me, is how administrative data can can not only help us improve the accuracy of our statistics, but they can help us address some of the overall challenges we face, not just here at the Census Bureau, but as a whole statistical community. And if we think about what those are, you know, we see declining participation in surveys, declining trust in government, and then that declining trust in surveys and government um, and the trust in the participation skew by population. So those are all the challenges to think about as we have our conversation today. So with those thoughts and the earlier panels, if you were able to see them serving as a foundation for today's dialogue, I'd love to just jump right into a conversation about the future. To joining me in that conversation are four experts from the Census Bureau. I'm just the prop here. They're the ones you really wanna to listen to. First, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Sally Ann Keller, who is the newly appointed Associate Director and Chief Scientist of the Census Bureau's Research and Methodology Directorate. Sally, so thrilled to have you here. We're also joined today by Tasha Boone, who is our Assistant Director for Communications. She's here today to add to the conversation about how communications work is important to the dialogue around administrative data. John Voorhees is an economist who uses demographic and administrative data linked with geospatial information on pollution and other hazards to ultimately study how environmental inequality affects people and businesses in the United States. I started my career in NOAA, so that's near and dear in my heart. John, thank you for joining us today. Finally, last but not least, Sean Klimek oversees the business research area in the Census Bureau's Center for Economic Studies. That's a group of nearly 40 researchers, 20 of whom are PhD, PhD economists. His area has actually developed statistical products like the business dynamic statistics and the business formation statistics, and his work broadly supports the economic measurement activities that the Census Bureau undertakes, especially in close correlation with uh, one section of our agency called the Economic Directorate. So I think we're just about ready to get started. I want to take just a couple of minutes for those of you who are not familiar with WebEx. So many virtual platforms out there now, um, but I want to make sure everyone has an easy experience today. If you would like to ask us a question, and we hope you do, please find the Q&A feature. I want to point out that this is not the chat box. That is how we will communicate with you. I think our host has already put in a couple of notes for everyone there. And to make sure we see your question, please make sure we put it in the Q&A feature. If you don't easily see that available, there are a couple places it could be. There's a menu at the bottom. Um, you could see three dots on the right, or you could see a little box with a question mark in it. These are both your signs that you're in the right spot. Um, there are a couple ways it might display on your screen. And when you do type a question, please select the option that lets it send it to all panelists to make sure someone on our team sees it. We'll try and grab them out of the Q&A feature as our conversation winds down, and hopefully we'll have time to answer a few questions that you've sent in. Lastly, I do want to reiterate this webinar is being recorded so we can make it available to you on our website for continued reference. Um, right, I think we're ready. I had an idea for one question to get us warmed up. 
I was thinking about this last night and I'd love to hear from each of you one word or phrase that comes to mind when you think about the future and administrative data. Just one word or phrase. Anyone want to jump on that one? I will, Jen. I think it's Thanks, a Tasha. great way to get us uh, jumped off and started. For me, I could think of a number of different words, but I'll start with transformation. Jen, I'll jump in with equity. Um, I'll say opportunity. And I guess I'll round it out with resilience. I, okay, my head is spinning. I love all of those words. Those are short sentences, but really big words, right? Um, and I bet many of them aren't ones that our listeners associate with administrative data. So I'm filled with exciting ideas about how to take this conversation forward. My hunch is when you were saying those words, there was a lot in your minds too. And, and we as Census Bureau professionals parse out the work that we do in, into what I would describe as a life cycle, right? We collect the data from businesses and places and people, we process the data, we protect them, and then we release them. So trying to think about those four words as they apply to each phase of our work. Um, can you help me think through to start out where you see those words in that collection phase, that collection part of the life cycle? I'll, I'll get us started, Jen. Um, my words, transformation. And <clears throat> I would start with just thinking about the fact that the Census Bureau has had a long, rich history of transforming and um, changing how we do our business across all of those phases ever since the first census, right? And you just think about how far we've come and some of the innovations that uh, the Census Bureau has pushed um, for us to change and how we change, but it's also the changing environment and the demands that our customers have uh, for warning uh, data that's easily uh, digestible, that is user-friendly, is downloadable, that makes sense and simple. Um, and there's an ever demand for more data. And so we just simply can't continue to do things the way we've always done them. We have to continue our rich history of transformation and evolving to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the public and effectively measuring people, places, and economy. So I would say that we just need to continue to explore other ways of how we can do that job. And, and building on what Tasha said, Jen, on transformation, when I think of equity, equity has a has many dimensions to it. So if we start to open up um, the opportunity for not just using a one size fits all form of data collection, but start really thinking of how we're collecting data and information about people, places in the economy from multiple sources, multiple sources of administrative data, you know, both government and private sector. It just kind of opens up what we can do. We can now think about how to redistribute resources so that we can fill in gaps of perhaps historically underrepresented individuals or establishments. And that provides more equity in the coverage that we do. We also have the opportunity to have a much richer set of data, much more complete set of data perhaps, which brings us data equity around the things we're trying to measure. Um, so this just, really provides us the opportunity to do what all of our stakeholders want us to do, to push things out that are more timely, more geographic granularity, better coverage and representativeness of what we do. At least that's the hope of what we think can be accomplished through this sort of multi-source data collection. I love that. And and, and to tag on to, to what Sally was saying, um, I think one really big opportunity that uh, administrative data has is to sort of illuminate gaps that our traditional ways of collecting data, um, you know, might not have been performing as well. So it, it tells us what we've been missing. Um, and so using administrative data can sort of uh, sort of identify vulnerable populations who haven't necessarily been well um, covered or well measured in our traditional survey based methods. So you could think about, for instance, highly mobile populations who are uh, at different addresses from year to year and are, are often very hard to survey. 
And I think there's there's also sort of a similar exercise on on the business side when we're measuring businesses using administrative data really allows us to identify what our standard set of survey questions might be missing by allowing us to sort of at a high frequency identify what what businesses have been uh, have been sort of doing in, the, in their day to day operations. Yeah, and I, and I think that's where the opportunity piece comes in, right? Is is we recognize that we're not always uh, covering kind of all parts of the population uh, in the same way. We have this opportunity to add administrative data kind of into our general measurement analysis, our 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 uh, data, the data infrastructure at the Census Bureau, so that we can learn more. And sort of more accurately portray, you know, populations and subpopulations moving forward. And just to add on to, to what everyone said, as well as, um, you know, being prompted a little bit by a question that's just come in from Adeline Wilcox. Um, if we keep the end in mind of what we're doing, uh, the, you know, the Bureau is about developing data products and trying to push out really good data products that, you um, inform us about something. And so now we have this opportunity to really think about what are all the data sources that we can pull together to help build that data product. So it's not just about what is a survey that we're gonna do, but we've got survey data, we have administrative data. How do we build on the best of all of these different data sources to develop data products that are really useful? So the question was about the CVAP, the citizenship uh, data product that the census has developed and will we do that indefinitely you know around the AC, you know in relationship to the ACS well indefinite is a pretty big word but we definitely are looking for opportunities for building data products like those that we can be pushing out first experimentally and then on a more official basis and we also need to make sure based on what Sally is saying in this question is that we need to ensure that we're chatting with folks um, and finding out what their needs are. What do they need and making sure that we are addressing that need with the right data products. No need for us to create things that people aren't using. <laughs> Absolutely, especially when resources are limited, right? I'm hearing a lot of amazing thoughts from you all about administrative data and how Really, they can help our collection keep pace with and measure a changing world. And I have to imagine that there are some challenges in this arena. I'm thinking here, we went through a pandemic the past couple of years. We obviously shifted the entire 2020 census. Um, we know there were some impacts on some of our other surveys. And I'm curious to understand how administrative data can help us in those scenarios in the future. I'm sure the, you know, where we had or others had to stop data collection, they could rely on administrative data sources. But I imagine that those data sources also stop collection. Um, so what does that do to the overall data collection dynamic and, and what needs to change in the future? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. So, so I think the, the IRS is a really good example. A lot of the, a lot of the business data, um, highly leverages administrative data from the Internal Revenue Service. And some of the data that we got from the Internal Revenue Service did have some delays, right? So to the extent that uh, businesses and individuals were filing electronically, those records continued to come in, but lots of the paper forms sort of sat on people's desks at the IRS and, and didn't have an opportunity to be, to be keyed. At, at the same time, uh, the Census Bureau was able to use um, the the business. So on the business formation statistics side, there's applications for employer identification numbers. They were completely electronic, and we were able to start producing weekly statistics on business formations to be able to to look at something much higher frequency than what we'd ever been able to do in the past. And that was that was really kind of generated in response to the pandemic and the kind of the thirst for information happening on a very high frequency basis. So that was something that we started doing weekly. We'd never really thought about doing it before, and it was really only possible using kind of administrative data. 
And there are a lot of challenges, of course, with this, you know, so, so Sean's just given some really wonderful examples that of how we could use it, but the question comes up, well, how good is it? Um, how do we know that this data is actually strong enough to form the foundation for some of the gold standards of official statistics that we're, you know, that we would like to be able to produce? And it's really important to recognize that that's a lot of our research activities is that we very methodically are trying to look at the sources that we're trying to determine whether they might be useful for the development of different data products. Um, worrying about, well, what if this source disappears? I spend multiple years figuring out how to use this particular administrative data source, but then all of a sudden, it's no longer available. What are the mitigation strategies that we have to put in place to ensure that we can continue to deliver to our stakeholders some of the different data, some of the different data products that they need? And also the question, another question that just came in, which is really useful at this particular point from Matthew Smith, is about small municipalities who don't really have the resources on their own to do their own surveys and budgets that can actually help generate perhaps data that would be really useful for different problems that um, that we would like to be able to use. Well, that's part of the hope that the administrative data can help us with, is it can help us in two ways. One, it might be a source of data that we can use from those municipalities. Take housing stock as a great example that's pretty available through um, tax records or through different data aggregators that can be used to characterize these small municipalities. Or given that we have rich sources of data to characterize other areas, we could possibly put more resources forward to fill the gap on some of the smaller municipalities. And so I think this is this is actually a good example of like one um, really key opportunity that administrative records um, sort of opens up, which is that it can allow us to reduce burdens that we're placing on the responding public by sort of optimizing what we're asking people when we send out surveys. So if we have administrative records that give us information on populations, we can sort of use those administrative records to produce new data products instead of asking people those questions. And then we can sort of redistribute the sort of burden that we were placing on people by asking these sort of duplicative questions and focus on questions that are really high value that aren't well covered by administrative records where we really do have to go out into the field and, and ask people survey questions. Um, this is, I think, part of a, you know, you can, you can sort of see where this sort of pops up in a number of places. Um, I think I think this broadly speaks to how integrating data sets and thinking about not just surveys and not just administrative records, but what we get when we combine them together is really important. That that incidentally is sort of like very key to my uh, research interests around understanding the impacts of climate change. Um, I, I think that might be getting a little ahead of the conversation, um, but I think you know what everyone has said. I think is is really key. Administrative records opens up a lot of possibilities. And I hear what you're what you're saying, John, is like um, getting ahead into the like the processing part even yeah. of a, a life cycle. Um, so I, I want to come back to that. This is such a great discussion, and so far I'm hearing a, a lot of a lot of opportunity actually. So I think it was Sean who said opportunity. You, you clearly picked the the winner word, um, but they're all so important. Um, and I just, John, I know what you were saying, you're so close to your heart, the resiliency piece. I wanted to see before we move out of the data collection part of the life cycle, if there's anything you wanted to say about that. Yeah, I mean, so actually the sort of recent COVID-19 pandemic provides a, a really great example of how administrative records can, can help us with uh, being resilient in the face of shocks to our own data collection efforts. Um, so, uh, you know, at the at the sort of height of, the sort of stay-at-home orders that happened in March and April of, of 2020, um, there were pretty severe disruptions to our ability to go out in the field and ask people questions. And this provided a, a, a really big challenge to a number of our surveys and to the decennial census in 2020. But using administrative records, we can sort of A, optimize and sort of do a lot to sort of mitigate those challenges when we face a severe shock. Um, and then also we can sort of on the back end, especially on the survey side, sort of maybe uh, sort of 
take care of some of the the sort of shock that 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 happened. I think the the best example here is the American Community Survey, which sort of faced a big challenge in the 2020 data year, sort of related to how we were able to do collection, um, especially in in sort of that that crucial period when um, sort of face to face interviewing was just not a not a possibility. Um, but we we have a lot of administrative records on the characteristics of the households that we were surveying. And so we could sort of really carefully look at what non response patterns looked like in that crucial period and use those administrative records to retool the way that we did waiting for non response uh, in a way that sort of uh, sort of mitigated a, a lot of the sort of potential damage that could have happened if we had just sort of like rolled over and, and sort of taken the shock. Um, and, and I think that that's that's really key to what administrative records opens up, right? It, it, it gives us another uh, tool in the toolkit that we can use. If we have a big shock, we have we can go to administrative records, we can go to surveys. Um, and the more that we have, the more that we're able to sort of keep our um, high value uh, data production going. I love that. And I think I have a feeling we're going to talk a lot about this in the future. <laughs> um, the resiliency element of it, but there's such a it's so tightly coupled with the equity piece. And, and Sally, you touched on that. And Tasha touched on it at the very beginning of our conversation, like how we free up resources to to be able to dedicate work toward populations that are historically undercounted. But also when we talk about shocks to the pandemic, right? Um, not only is that the data collection, um, but the people who were most impacted by the pandemic and least represented in some of the data sets to, that, were, that were being collected were also more the historically undercounted populations, right? So the equity piece comes in a couple of different places and the resiliency piece comes in a couple of different places. We could probably do a whole panel just on that, but I've heard our conversation naturally nudging itself toward the processing part of our life cycle of data so I'd love to spend a few minutes thinking about how opportunity, equity, resiliency, and transformation, Tasha, I know that's one of our favorite words, um, applies to that phase of it. Um, and I think that's a part of that processing piece is a part that our listeners don't really see. It can be a bit of a black box sometimes. Um, and so I bet it's it, this is going to be a really fun place for them to think about how that part of the life cycle can be impacted by administrative data. I'd love, I know, Sean, this is where you like roll up your sleeves on things. I'd love to hear your thoughts, especially. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one, one great example of um, where administrative data can really be leveraged is to, is to build longitudinal data products directly from the administrative data. Um, you know, we've, we've mentioned uh, burden on the public several times, right? So the the kinds of stati longitudinal statistics where you would keep on having to survey the same household or the same person or the same business over and over and over to be able to look at sort of dynamic changes uh, to those to those businesses or individuals, we can really do well with administrative data, right? Where you know we we've built kind of entire longitudinal databases of businesses and, and jobs and able and have been able to produce entirely new statistics without really burdening anyone and it's almost sort of the opposite of what we've been talking a lot about where the administrative data helps us kind of better do surveys and censuses it's almost the reverse where we're using the administrative data to build the data product and then supplementing it with a lot of the data that we're collecting in our censuses and surveys, which is kind of a really great opportunity. And I think part of what Sean's getting at there um, is that we've been able to do a lot of great research um, and implementation on improving our editing and imputation that goes along with our data collection, you know, sort of filling in the holes when, when we need to, when we can't get, you know, data from different um, units or households or businesses or things like that. So the administrative data really helps us out there. And I think the place where administrative data also really is helpful that people may not realize is in our field operations. It, it, it actually helps us optimize where to go collect data, what, you know, what household to actually go and administer a survey at what time of day to maximize the opportunity that somebody might be home that could actually, um, you know, answer this information. So it helps us in just all phases of our, you know, production process. And 
And that's useful because any place we can, you know, save in the collection of information over here means that we can then apply more effort in a different way to fill in these gaps. And, and, and I should also say, just because people worry about this, we're not implying that surveys are going to go away. We know that surveys are difficult, that the response rates are going down and all of that. But, you know, there are certain kinds of questions and information that a survey talking to you may be the only way we can get that information. Well, let's focus on that and let's fill in with other information for different types of uh, variables that we don't need a survey question for. I love that. And, and as you talked, Sally, what struck me was that all four of these words you all chose all kind of lead to each other in different directions, right? Where there's where there's um, opportunity, it can lead to resiliency transformation, can create equity, resiliency, and equity issues are paired together. So uh, someone needs to write a book on all this probably. Maybe they have and I haven't read it. I don't know. Um, but John, <laughs> earlier, I, I um, you, you were starting to talk about some great ideas about that integration, that data set integration piece. And I was wondering if there was more you wanted to say about that. Yeah, and, and actually, I think like picking up from, from Sally's point, um, I think this is, this is actually like a great example of how combining multiple data sets together, administrative records and survey data um, can, can give us a lot more nuance and a lot more better understanding of, of the people and businesses of the United States. So if you take, for example, a cross-sectional survey that we uh, might conduct like the American Community Survey, we, we ask a lot of information about people's circumstances at a point in time. And as Sean noted, we can attach administrative records to those survey responses and sort of characterize people's experiences before and after that. But we can also use family linkages to, to sort of build in more context on people's parents' circumstances, which is really, I think, a, a really deep thing that would be very difficult to do in a, in a sort of survey collection uh, on the size of the American Community Survey. So that's sort of like doing a panel study on income dynamics at ACS sample size. That's just incredibly difficult. But we have all of the technology to be able to sort of construct that by combining the detailed survey information that we have uh, with sort of uh, intergenerational linkages between parents and children and with these longitudinal uh, data sets that we have on, on people's locations and, and, and their uh, incomes and, and other circumstances. So I think this is, this is really sort of a, a fruitful area where uh, there's, there's just a lot that we can do. And Tasha, oh, you read my mind. <laughs> but there's a transformation piece in here because that's right. <laughs> all that it sounds really easy linking things together, but what does that mean? for our day-to-day -day work internally and systems and transforming them. Yeah, you know, that's a very good point, Jen. And in reality, you know, I wanna to touch on something John um, was just talking about when he was talking about the American Community Survey and Sean was talking about appending the administrative data. You know, from a communications perspective, you know, people often contact us and say, you know, I've already provided this information to the government, you know, why are you asking me this again? So when we're looking at administrative data, it's also about an efficiency standpoint of people providing information already and why aren't we utilizing that information across the board? Uh, given that people from a burden perspective have already said I've given it and so that we can utilize that data in the most um, appropriate way, obviously. Um, and so um, why not we do that and then we alleviate some of the burden. But speaking also internally, you know, obviously we are uh, transforming across the Census Bureau, looking at all our different areas, including our systems and how we need to do better to be able to process and integrate data and provide the rich source of all the data. Um, so that, like Sally said, we still going to need surveys and censuses, but we don't have to just rely on that information um, coming in um, from the census and surveys if we can find other ways to provide the data that is needed. 
but it's about all of it working together. And so internally within the Census Bureau, we do have to make sure that everything that we're doing is working together, transforming together um, to ensure that we're having the best system and processes to put out the best data, again, to measure people, places, and economy. And, and just to, to build a little bit on that, I just, so, so you, you know, um, Jen, at least you know, <laughs> the Bureau does a lot of surveys, right? Collects a lot of data, American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, the Business Surveys, you know, the list goes on and on, on both the economic side and the household side. Well, when we're talking about integrating data and combining data, we are talking about how do we leverage our own data and integrate across these different uh, programs to help build new and fantastic data products. You know, John's climate change efforts cuts across multiple of both our own products, our own programs, as well as other sorts of things. So to accomplish this, you know, we've been, you know, kind of faced with how do we modernize ourselves so that we can have more enterprise wide um, systems and opportunities to take advantage of all this data and information. And there's resiliency in that too, right? Like also. from a infrastructure perspective, <laughs> right? Um, multiple and, data sources and, gives us that resiliency. Sean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and 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 I think a, a a good example, you know, one of the one of the kind of foundational things that we need to be able to do at the Census Bureau is to really be able to to link all of these data together, so that when we're bringing in new administrative data, whether that be kind of person level data or business level data, we have the ability to, to link it to other things at the Census Bureau. And I think on the person side, we've really been able to do a good job of putting uh, keys onto the data that make it very linkable. It's it's definitely been, it's more challenging, I think, in a number of ways on, on the business side. So I think that that's, you know, that kind of technology is really going to go a long way towards kind of this, this integration that Sally's talking about of being able to kind of break down barriers between the different types of data at the Census Bureau and be able to bring them together. So I think a good example would be being able to say, you know, link data from the Small Business Administration to kind of Census Bureau data to, to look at uh, you know, business owner demographics and how their participation in various SBA programs would, would differ. And that was something that, that is something that, that, uh, the SBA is really interested in with so many sort of COVID related, uh, programs that, that happened during the pandemic. And John, what, what what comes to mind when you hear what Sean's running through there? No, yeah. I know you, you, there's a researcher in you just dying yeah. to say something. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so this is I I think there's 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 um so much data that we have that often we can sort of sort of get different answers to the same question, right? So one one sort of example that I, I'm really interested in as a researcher, right, is we do the decennial census where we go out and we knock on doors and, and we count people. We also have all these administrative records and we can sort of try and do an administrative record census where we try and enumerate the population using just our administrative records. And 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 I think we're going to get different answers when we do these two things. And and so I think a, a sort of key thing for equity and, and transformation and, and resilience is thinking about carefully what answers we get when we do things in different ways and how we can use models or, or other statistical techniques to provide sort of the best answer to the American public, uh, rather than just sort of saying, we've always counted people, we knocked on doors, this is the answer. And, and I think one, one opportunity, another opportunity that administrative data gives us is that when we develop new methods for um, imputing data, uh, you know, better methods for editing that we can go back a lot of times with the administrative data and implement those changes for an entire time series in a data product in a way that you can't necessarily do for a, a survey. Fascinating. And, and just to be clear, I didn't say this up front. I'm a strategy director for communications at the Census Bureau. So I hear all of this talk about research and administrative data, and I completely default to my 
communications comfort space, which I imagine Tasha, you do too. But what's exciting about that is it makes me think about how we can use administrative data to communicate with people in the context of the economic census, the decennial census, whatever it is. Tasha, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, if you have any, not to put you on the spot. Uh, thanks, Jen. I appreciate that. Um, you're absolutely right. From a communications perspective, this is fascinating and it cuts across all four of those uh, words that are key words that we have. And in reality, it is about messaging. You know, we want to make sure that we are understanding what the issues and concerns are, but we also want to make sure that we're providing the right message uh, to the right folks um, in the way that they want to hear and know about what the message is regarding um, administrative data and what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. And again, I fall back to what I said earlier that people have given us a lot of data, and I say us in government and other agencies, and they expect us to be judicious in how we use it and um, so that they don't feel like they have to keep uh, giving us the same data over and over. And um, for us, we do a lot of research and communications to make sure that we're understanding people's mindsets, right? Uh, what are they thinking? Um, what are the barriers? What are the attitudes that they have around certain topics so that we are delivering the right messages? So for us, we want to know, we want to talk to people, we want to understand what their fears and barriers are if there are any around um, any topic that we're talking about at the Census Bureau. So we are uh, making sure that we are addressing and understanding them and addressing them. And it's not just about the messages, but it's about and how we communicate and what we're actually doing uh, with our operations and research and um, technology. Yeah, and that makes me think about, you know, if we're using administrative data to capture people in the collection phase. How do we, from a communications perspective, how do we make those people feel like they were counted and participated in this great civic process and what the ad campaign for that looks like, right? That's a different campaign and a different audience in a sense. I'm sure we had have like a whole other panel on that one. <laughs> Yeah, I think we definitely could have another one. And, you know, the thing about it is, is just like everything is changing. We we're talking about transformation. My word is transformation. And so, um, you know, as we continue um, progressing each year, there are different technologies and different ways of communicating that are coming into play. And so advertising may be it. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of digital advertising during the 2020 census, and that may be different in how we proceed in the future. So what our responsibility is as a Census Bureau, which you've heard this theme on this panel today, is under, do the research, understand what the issues are, what the concerns are, asking the right questions so that we can then deliver on the right way to engage people. And that's what we're talking about here. I love it. Um, I think we're starting to get into the part of the conversation, that phase in the life cycle where we talk about releasing data products and where administrative data comes into that. But before we hop into that section, I wanna circle back to something you said earlier, Sean, um, because we got a question in the Q&A feature about it. Someone asked what makes it harder to make ID keys for businesses versus people? And I know you mentioned that as a reality. So I wanted to touch on that for a second because I bet there's there's more than one listener thinking that through right now. Yeah, that's right. So, so I would say that most of the linking on the business side is done by employer identification numbers. So it's the kind of the... Um, unique identifier on the business side that the Internal Revenue Service uses to track business activity. But but unlike a social security number, that's sort of like a one number linked to one person kind of always, EINs can change for like a variety of reasons. You can switch from a, a sole proprietorship to a partnership and you'll apply for a new EIN and you're in practice kind of the same business, but you're but your kind of linkage key that we would use would, would be different. And then there's lots of nuances where, you know, the location of the establishment might not be the location of the headquarters, which 
you know, and the person filling the form might might be the accountant, and so the mailing address might be, uh, you know, the address of an accountant. So it so it tends to be a little bit messier on the business side when we're trying to do linkages across uh, data sets. I'm learning stuff as we talk. So listener who asked that question, thank you. You're educating me as well. Um, that, was, that was an important pause to take. Um, thank you everyone for hanging in there with us so far. I hope you're finding this conversation as educational um, as I am, but also as thought provoking. I wanna spend just a few minutes, um, we're kind of answering questions as we go, um, but I wanna spend a few minutes talking about how administrative data can play a role in the release of data products, but also in what we release. Um, and then I'm gonna put y'all on the spot a little bit, but I'm gonna start right now by giving you time to think about it. I wanna wrap up in a few minutes by hearing big parting thoughts from you. And then if we have some time, we'll keep uh, seeing if there are Q and A's in the, in the Q and A feature. So, but uh, for now, let's jump into thinking about, again, what administrative, what role administrative data can play in the release of data products and in what we release. Any thoughts from anyone there? What do you think, Sally? Well, so as I said earlier, it's, I think it's important to kind of keep the data product kind of that end in mind, what it is we're trying to develop and think about all of the different data sources that could be brought together to actually inform the purpose or use the product that we're trying to, to develop. Um, you know, so you could dream in a data discovery sense, you know, what, what with all this data that's out there in the wild and, and all the data that we have within the Bureau, if I could have any data that I wanted, what what would what would be the most helpful for building this product? So you can begin to think about that and then try to look around and see how you can find that information or or actually gather that data. But at the same time, um, we hear people talk about having all these data sources and doing this data integration means that I'm going to have more accuracy in the estimates that I build. And that's, as you know, is one of my favorite words our favorite things I like to talk about because it gives me an opportunity to remind everyone what we mean by accuracy. It isn't necessarily the case that integrating all of these data sources is gonna give us something more precise, something you know about that, about that thing that we're trying to estimate, a better income distribution or a better housing count or any number of things that we do, but, it is going to give us a much more accurate picture of what we know and what we don't know about the thing it is we're trying to estimate. So when we say that it gives us more accuracy, that's what we're really talking about. It gives us much more information about what we really understand from all of these data sources. And back to our original discussion on gaps, where are those gaps that we now need to go try to fill in other ways? So I think that's really important to keep in mind that it's not some holy grail that's just going to all of a sudden give us much more precision in everything we do. No, it's just going to teach us about what we know and what we don't know and what to do. So about teach, us, teach us more about our uncertainty. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Perfect. Yeah. Just making sure I'm learning the right way here. Um, fascinating. So I actually want to pick up on the first Please, thing that you yeah. said, Sally, because um, this is actually lines up with an experience that I often have. So when we onboard new researchers at the Census Bureau, usually they're coming from academia. They've just finished a dissertation where they spent five or six years with a very specific question that they needed to answer. And they've been thinking about what data they need to answer it. And then they join the Census Bureau and it's actually almost the opposite, right? So we have all of this data in the world and what we need to do is find the best questions that we can answer with that data. And that's a very different way of thinking about things. And that actually highlights something about data products, right? That's very important. The availability of administrative records allows for sort of the development of unexpected new uh, things that we can produce, right? You have to go into the data, you have to link it all together, do this integration, and then you'll find out new things about the world that we can develop into new data products that we might not have expected. Um, so that's, I think, a very important sort of part of this whole data products piece. I love that. Sean, have you had an experience like that? Yeah, I mean, the the one thing I'll the one thing I'll say is that 
that I think it's so we've talked a lot about sort of people within the Census Bureau researchers that have ideas for for new data products and we certainly have a, a diverse group of of stakeholders and, and data consumers but the kind of the new group that we're that we've like hinted around a little bit is about all of these new data providers right and the data providers that really know their data might also be getting requests right so we had someone talk about what can we do for you know data on small municipalities right and those are the kinds of um you know potentially you know those are also data providers if they're collecting administrative data and the kinds of questions that the that a census bureau data product might be able to answer would be really broad because it would not be just for a single municipality but for lots and lots of municipalities throughout the country or through the states. And so I think the LEHD program is kind of a great example where I think the original products that were envisioned for that program weren't really what the end, the end products didn't really look like the original products that were envisioned, right? Because they they really were shaped and changed by the all the all of the data providers. And so I think that's going to be kind of a valuable source of information and direction kind of going forward. And and I think we're gonna need to to probably uh, have something in it for the data providers as well, right? They're, they're gonna want their stakeholder st stakeholders to be able to have some questions answered that they can't necessarily do just with their data, but could do it with their data combined with census data. Interesting, Sean, just real quick for our listeners who aren't familiar, can you do a one second soundbite on what LEHD is and what that acronym stands for. <laughs> Sorry, I'm falling back into my government. You're okay. You're acronym okay. Acronym problems. So it's um, Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program, and it takes unemployment insurance data from the states um, and produces a, a suite of statistical products using using those data, and uh, we're able to really pull together the data from all of the states and produce, you know, national national products that really cover everyone. The individual states could do a lot of it too, but what they tend to miss is transitions from one state to another. They can't, you know, so, you know, Texas can see people in Texas, but can't see them once they move to California or New York or Maryland or Virginia. And so the national program, you know, at the Census Bureau is really able to capture those transitions and follow people longitudinally. And, and I just want to add that it's it's a you know it's a wonderful program where there are these um, you know agreements with all of the states or or nearly all of the states who have agreed to provide data because they're getting some benefit back and it's a lot on labor force type of things. Well, just imagine if we could add more data stores to that from the states if we were now being able to uptake SNAP, WIC, TANF. Um, educational, longitudinal educational system type of data, you know, in a similar partnership where we're able to get access and have the right relationships with the states, and we're able to build data products that are longitudinal and push back that provides them a window into their state and the surrounding states and the quality of life of the people they represent in new ways. That would be pretty fun. And I think on top of that, when you think about, um, you know, the program that um, Sean just mentioned, you know, in reality, there are so many different programs and products that we have at the Census Bureau data that we do currently have that is so useful and not everybody knows about all of them. There's specific data users and people who really focus on one particular data set or a couple of different ones from a particular survey or census. But we have such a wealth of data and probably like a lot of people don't even realize how much data that we provide and put out there to help areas that have been hit by natural disasters. We just went through Hurricane um, Ian and there was a lot of data that we were able to provide to help those areas with understanding who's impacted and where. And so the more that we have to uh, rich, richer data sets and data that we can provide and intake through like the ones that Sally mentioned, it just helps even more those areas that are impacted by natural disasters. 
And and if I can toot my own horn a little bit, a, a lot of the climate and environment related work um, that I've been working on with with other folks here at the Census Bureau has a lot of these features that we've been talking about. Um, so oftentimes we're in the sort of position of trying to take information that NOAA or NASA or FEMA has already collected on the sort of physical uh, economy and this, a disaster that happened, a sort of uh, you know level of pollution exposure that, from forest fires that that sort of you know can be observed from from uh, satellites. And then we can combine that with our census data and produce new things. Now, this is actually very useful to those sister agencies, and that's something that I'm hoping that we're going to be able to sort of learn from what LEHD was able to do, sort of give back some information to, to NOAA and FEMA and, and NASA and sort of build partnerships so that we can both sort of expand the set of things that census is able to, to talk about, but also produce really useful information for people on the ground. So in the hurricanes case that sort of we've been talking about, FEMA only knows the people who applied for their individual assistance. They don't know the set of people who are eligible, but we can use census data potentially to sort of identify the sort of set of eligible individuals and then think about uh, where FEMA sort of did uh, historically a poor job of, of getting take up to the individual assistance program versus areas where they seem to have done better. And then they can use that to sort of improve um, sort of responses to, to natural disasters going forward. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of sort of really really big upside I think in this sort of climate disaster space. Real remarkable suite of opportunity for the future to help with resiliency and equity, um, uh, and so much opportunity. And I get so excited. I listeners, I mentioned earlier that I started my career in NOAA, so I get so excited by the types of work that you're outlining, John. And I think that that just really underscores something for me that makes me excited to work at the Census Bureau now, which is. The work that we do isn't just playing with numbers for fun. It has real tremendous impact on people every day. And the work that you've been doing around resiliency and um, especially after natural disasters really highlights that. All right, quick time check. We've got about seven minutes left. I want to respect everybody's time. Um, I just want to hear a couple big overarching thoughts from y'all and listeners. If you have questions, shoot them in the um, Q&A feature there and we'll answer them as, as we go through our big thoughts. What comes to you when you think about the future and administrative data, as especially when you think about those those four words we started out with, equity, resiliency, transformation, opportunity? I guess I think about how do we build trust? How do we build trust with um, partners that we would like to partner with on, on data, with our stakeholders and people who consume our data products with the with the public? You know, because we're talking about integrating a lot more data together than ever before. And we have a strong tradition uh, for maintaining confidentiality and, and using the most modern privacy protection uh, in today's language, formal privacy methods on our data products before we push them back to the public. Um, so we need to maintain that trust and we need to take time to make sure that all of our partners here understand that. And then the question that you uh, brought up earlier, Jen, we need to also build trust that people realize that they are in our data, even if we haven't gone to their door to collect that information, that they are participating and they are part of the stories that these data tell. So those are some of the thoughts that come to mind to me. Those are great ones. What do, what's on your mind, Tasha, Sean, John? Yeah, I'll jump in here with going back to my word um, transformation and, um, you know, what Sally said was so important regarding trust. And as we look to transform and continue transforming and evolving and innovating and in how we do our work, we are the caretakers of people's data. Uh, and just as, as Sally mentioned, we have to um, get that trust and work on it every single day every single day, um, but through transformation, innovation, um, and making sure that we are addressing the needs of the public, hopefully they trust us to do so, um, but we will continue to innovate and, and, and listen and hear from people so that we're delivering what they need. It's not just about what we need, it's about what they need to make their lives uh, better. 
And and I guess what I would say, I'd echo a little bit uh, about you know Sally Sally emphasizing emphasizing trust. Um, I know my word was opportunity, um, but it, you know, in, in some sense, the you know the Census Bureau is almost obligated to pursue um, administrative and third party data sources to help fulfill its mission. We really have a really a uh, broad mandate to do that to support our programs. And then the advantage is that Title 13 really provides a super strong protection, not just to the data that we collect from individuals, but also the administrative records that we bring into the Census Bureau. And so I just hope that people take away that this isn't us just trying to, the Census Bureau just trying to gobble up as many you know, administrative uh, data points as possible. It's really something that we're supposed to do. And then we're going to protect that um, to the same extent as the individual data that we collect from businesses and people. And, and sort of I'll, 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 I'll pick up on these threads. I think, you know, as everyone is saying, you know, the American public has sort of trusted us with their data when we ask them survey questions, they answer our survey questions. When they participate in programs for other federal agencies, that data sort of enters the administrative record. And I think uh, we sort of need to take it very seriously that we sort of have been entrusted with this and we need to make the most of it. We need to protect people's privacy, but we also need to do the best we can to optimize this great trove of data that sort of we have and produce the best information that we can and the most information that we can while preserving privacy. And I think that requires breaking down some silos, not thinking about Census Bureau as a place that you know, conducts this survey and the survey, and then there's another part of the Census Bureau that conducts a decennial census, but rather we need to be a data agency. We just collect, we have a, a data from a number of different sources, we integrate that data together, and we produce data products. And going forward, I think that's the only way that we can sort of fulfill our or sort of mission and our duty, I would say, to use the data that we've been entrusted with by the American public to the best um, and most um, uh, effective way possible. Those are all great, and and John, absolutely love what you're saying. That becomes a real branding communications issue for for me and Tasha, frankly, um, and and all of our good colleagues in the communications shop here at the Census Bureau. That conversation about how do we better tie all of our work together. That, to increase response and increase use and increase engagement with stakeholders in each phase of this process. Um, it was really exciting to think about what the future what the future brings. Um, I'll throw one quick last ask the questions. I think we've gotten to pretty much all of them. Um, we've just a couple minutes left here. Um, but uh, as we're waiting to see if any come in, I can't thank you all enough for, for spending an hour of your time with us, whether you're watching us live or after the fact, once we put this recording up on the website. And thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I wouldn't have much to talk about here by myself. So thank you for, for joining today. Um, John, especially, I know you've been up uh, after a long night of travel. So appreciate that you never, you never would have known it. Um, no, I've not spilled your, spilled your secret. Um, I don't see any questions coming in. So I think we're ready to wrap up. Thank you everyone so much. I hope you have a lovely day, um, a lovely evening, morning, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this. Take care. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. That concludes today's session. You may disconnect at this time. Have a great rest of the afternoon.